Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's so good to have you all here at Third Service, uh, and happy Pentecost Sunday. You know, this is Pentecost Sunday, which is traditionally we celebrate Pentecost 50 days after Easter, uh, and as Pastor Joseph explained uh, during the announcements, it's when the Holy Spirit came upon the people, right? The Holy Spirit just really filled and baptized uh, the people in Mark's upper room, the first 120, and then... 3,000 people proceeded to get saved. So traditionally, it's also marked as the birth of the church. It's an amazing day in our church history, and I'm glad we're all here uh, to celebrate it. And my prayer is able to be filled with the Holy Spirit as we worship the Lord today. Amen? Well, today we're going to be closing out our sermon series on the book of Ephesians. It's now been, well, a little bit longer than six weeks because we had a break in there. Uh, but this is the, the last sermon on the book of Ephesians. And my hope and prayer is that each of us, you know, during this time, will be able to have gleaned a little bit more about who Jesus is in our life, right? And that how Jesus affects our relationship and our walk. Ephesians is this book, right, that is just rich with practical instruction and in how to live out your faith, right? To live out your faith in light of your relationship with Jesus, and today, we end, actually, with one of the most important sections of this book. Uh, this passage that, you know, Ariana read today was probably very familiar to you. Hopefully, if you've been churched at all, you've heard about the armor of God, right? You know, in, in Treehouse, I know they always talk about the armor of God, and they put up these amazing pictures of suits of armor, and they teach these kids uh, what it is to have the armor of God. Uh, and that comes right out of this passage, right, of Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. And through this passage, actually, Paul is summarizing and bringing to a head all his teaching on spiritual warfare, about what it is to have the power of God, but also how we use that power against our enemy. Like, we're going to come to understand through this sermon, hopefully, that you cannot stand on your own. Right? In this battle, you cannot stand on your own. You actually have to stand with the power of God. There is a specific reason, right, why Paul is talking about this full armor of God that he wants all of us to put on. Uh, and it's because the enemy attacks us, right? The enemy attacks, and there is a consequence we have if we're not ready to engage in that battle. And I want to tell you guys all, right from jump, that spiritual warfare is a very real thing. Just because you don't see it, maybe you don't understand it, or maybe you don't even believe it, doesn't mean that it's not happening, right? There is a battle that is constantly raging on, and it's important that we understand that it really is going on around us, even though you cannot see it with your own eyes. We have an enemy that is waiting lying in wait to attack us at any given moment. Some of the questions uh, that I want to ask and have you thinking about as we go through this sermon is, how do we get ready for and engage in this war? And what is the level of destruction when the enemy does attack us? How does this personally affect your life? Because whether you know it or not, it does, right? There is an effect when the enemy does attack. These are big questions, and hopefully they're going to be answered uh, in this passage for us today. And we begin here in verse 10. Actually, that's the whole passage. Let me get... We stand firm. This is where Paul begins. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You know, after teaching all through the Ephesians, like we get through, you know, the first five chapters, uh, and also now the second half, uh, of chapter 6, this is where Paul finally gets to the end, right? And he begins verse 10 with the word what? Finally. Finally. This is his last point that he's making to the church, to these brothers and sisters that he's taught uh, so faithfully. And he says, finally, be strong in whom? Be strong in the Lord and in his might. This is not about how strong we are. Right? This is not how strong I can be or what I can do. In this spiritual battle, there is no way for me to engage the enemy 
on my own accord, in my own strength, in my own talents. And I look around this room, I see a bunch of amazing people, right? You guys are, you're bright, intelligent, you're strong, you're more than capable. But even that doesn't get you a victory over the enemy. Because no matter how strong you may think you are, we don't have enough strength on our own to defeat the enemy. We need the strength that comes from our God, right? Our strength and power comes from God and God alone. And this is why Paul says throughout this passage, he says stand firm three times in this short 10, past, or 10 verses, right? We're to stand firm in the Lord because he is ultimately the strength that we're looking for. And we're able to stand firm because of him. And this is why, this is ultimately why we put on the full armor of whom? Of God, right? We don't put on our own armor. We're not doing this on our own strength and accord, like I said. We are putting on the full armor of God. And that's why Paul writes in verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. It's God's armor, right? And this is a significant point for us to all know and remember. And we have to put it on. Like, you have to take an active step of putting on all this armor. It's one thing to know about it. It's one thing to understand it. But unless you actively have it on and you put on your full suit of armor, it means nothing, right? You have to have the full armor of God. And by doing so, we get ready for the battle that rages on all around us. This is how we're going to defend ourselves against the enemy's attack. You know, and I, I, as you read through this, and as I was reading through it and praying through it, I found this analogy or illustration about the armor pretty interesting, right? Because if you know the background of where Paul is as he's writing this, Paul is writing to the Ephesians from where? Do you guys know? He's writing from jail, right? He's imprisoned. And as I, I was reading through this, you think about it and you see Paul is probably looking out of his jail cell, and he sees a Roman soldier guarding him, right, fully decked out in his armor. And through this, God is kind of sharing to him and explaining to him about what it is to have a full body of armor on. And he's revealing through this soldier what it is that he needs to do and share. But before we get into the full body armor, who, the question begs, who are we fighting against? Because obviously we're told, being told to be prepared for something for a reason, right? There's a specific reason why we have to get ready and we have to get prepared. Because we do have an enemy. And that enemy we find in verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. It's kind of scary, right? Our enemy is Satan. It is the devil and all his little minions. And that's an absolute fact, and that's absolute truth, whether we want to believe that or not. One of my favorite movies that I really enjoyed watching is a movie called The Usual Suspects. I don't know if you guys have watched it before, but there's this great line that is said in this movie. It says, the greatest trick that ever the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Think about that for a second. The greatest trick is that he pulled off to the world is that he didn't exist. I believe that many of us, many of us in this room, don't acknowledge or don't believe that there is an enemy out there waiting for us. We live our lives almost blind to this fact and blind to the spiritual battle that is happening all, our, all around us. And I get it. I understand, right? It's hard to see it. It's hard to see something you cannot see with your own eyes. It's counterintuitive. I cannot see it. I don't understand it, so I don't believe that it's happening. Like the war that's happening in Russia and Ukraine, we know exactly that it's happening because we see it. The physical world is easy for us to see. You see the two sides. You see the two enemies fighting each other. But what about the spiritual war that's happening? What about the enemy that we can't see? Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's real, not real and doesn't mean it's not happening. Because the enemy would love, right, love for us to believe that he didn't exist. How easy for is it 
for him to defeat us when we don't even know that we're engaging in a battle or a fight. Can you imagine stepping into a fight and not knowing that you were in a fight and you were just getting hit left and right? You have no idea that it's happening? You have no offensive strikes whatsoever? That's what happens, right? When you don't believe that there is an enemy. That's the scariest place to be, right? When the enemy lurks and you don't see it. Because the unseen enemy is the most dangerous enemy that we can have. Think about it like this. What do you guys think is like the most deadliest, most ruthless weapon of war, right? Granted, like, you know, there's tanks, uh, there's machine guns, right? There's drones that fly around and attack you from miles away. But one of the deadliest weapons in warfare is actually a sniper rifle, right? Because a man that can stand a mile away from you that you don't see, you don't hear, you don't even know that's there can shoot and ultimately kill, right? And it happens. The sniper sits and lies and waits. And that's exactly what our enemy does. He sits and lies in wait and snipes at us when we're least expecting it. And this is why Paul says to take up and put on the full armor of God, right? We have to be ready for these shots and we have to stand firm in the Lord in order for us to be ready for this battle. So what do we do? Right? What is Paul telling us to do? He says we're to armor up, right? And we take on the full armor of God. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. How is a spiritual war fought? Is it from like miles away, you're fighting, there's an aircraft carrier in the water and it's shooting and there's planes that are flying over? No. This spiritual war is like hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? We are wrestling with the enemy. We are in this physical battle close contact fighting, and that's why we have to have our armor on, right? That we are ready to engage. So as we keep talking about the full armor of God, let's go through. Let's go through the full armor of God. The first thing we see is stand firm, having girded your loins with the truth, right? The first piece of armor is the belt of truth. What is it? Generally, the belt, right, for in the military or for these uh, armors, suit of armor would hold everything in place, right, for, for the soldier. You know, it would hold their, their breastplate, hold all the gear, all their armor, it would hold their uh, sword in place, keeps their pants up. Uh, so the belt is a very important piece of this armor. Uh, and for us, the believer, right, it is this truth, right? It is the belt of truth uh, that is what we are wearing and that Paul is instructing us to wear. But what is the truth? Right? What is the truth? Or better yet, who is the truth? Right? Jesus is the truth. Right? We see that from John 14, 6. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is Jesus, and the truth is the word of God. And the truth is what helps us stand against our enemy, right? Because how does the enemy attack truth? How does the enemy attack truth in your life? It is with lies, right? The enemy will attack your truth with lies. And these lies are big, they're subtle, some are small, but there's these precision cuts into your life. And the only way we encounter or we can counter the lies is with what? With the truth. Here, you, you can use the truth, right, from keep, to keep the lies from overcoming you. And the truth is what ultimately sets you free. Because remember, like I said, the enemy is lurking. And in, and in ways you don't even see or even expect, he will attack. And lies come in all shapes, in all sizes. And when you least expect it, you're being attacked with these lies. Let's say this, right? Like after a long day of whatever you do, whether you're in school, or you're working, right, and you get ready for bed, and whatever your, your night routine is, like, what do you do right before you go to bed? My guess is a lot of you, before you go to bed, you'll grab your phone, right? You're nice and relaxed, you're nice and comfortable. You grab your phone and you start scrolling through whatever social media 
uh, that you look through. Maybe you look through YouTube uh, and you're relaxed. You're not on guard. This is how you're unwinding. I submit to you, this is actually one of the most dangerous moments for you, right? This is one of the most challenging moments for you because you are not aware. You are not on the defensive. You don't have your belt of truth on because you're just relaxing and you're comfortable and you don't think the enemy's attacking you in this situation. But as you scroll through, whatever you scroll through, the enemy lurks, right? And you're looking through Instagram and there's this slight feeling that you have as you're looking through people's posts. Maybe it's jealousy, right? Maybe you think, oh wow, how fake are these pictures? How fake is this person? Right? There's this momentary lapse of readiness that you have and that's all the enemy needs to plant these seeds of lies into your life, into your heart. And he just watches it grow and he watches it fester. And all along, you had no idea that it even happened, right? Because in that moment, in that place, in that time, you were not ready and you were not guarded. The enemy has nothing but time, nothing but time. And all he wants to do is to poke these holes into your life of faith, poke these holes into your relationship with God. So he plays this long game. And this is where we need to be the most on guard. We have to be ready to fight, rebuke the enemy with truth, right? This is where you defend against the lies with the truth, the truth of God, with the word of God. The truth is that you are loved by the God most high. You, we are all his precious children and his love is big enough for all of us. And in those moments of doubt, in those moments of difficulty, in those moments of challenge, don't let the enemy plant a lie into your heart saying that, hey, he doesn't really love you. You're not good enough to be loved. These are all ways that the enemy plants these lies into your heart. And you have to be protecting of it, right? Like I said, it can happen at any moment, at any given time, in any situation. You have to ask yourself this too. How do you know? How do you really know if the enemy is attacking you or if you are under attack? And it can be answered like this, right? Have you ever had times of like, heightened emotional distress, times when you're just on the edge, you have no, no reason or understanding of why. Maybe you're deeply saddened about something. Maybe you are, are deeply angered about something, but you can't pinpoint why or you don't understand why. Because these aren't normal feelings. Like it's normal to be angry and normal to have sadness, but not these random moments of emotional distress. And I think it happens in our lives more than we care to admit or even acknowledge because these aren't normal things for a believer, right? Because the Bible tells us that we're to have joy, happiness, and love in our hearts, not fear, anger, and sadness. These are all little clues that you should be aware of, that maybe, maybe you are under attack by the enemy's lies. And then knowing that, what do you do? Paul tells us, you put on the belt of truth and you use the truth to take down Satan's lies in your heart, right? Jesus is the weapon of choice, and he is the way we defeat these lies in our heart. So we have to pay attention, right? Pay attention to where we are, how we're feeling, and what we're going through. Then we continue on, right? The next one is the breastplate of righteousness. It's that middle section in the picture uh, that you see that the belt is hold holding together. And what is this piece of armor, right? For the Roman soldier, this was the main piece of armor that he was wearing. This is what protected that whole chest area. But more importantly, it protected all the vital organs and what is the biggest vital organ in that area, right? It protects the heart. It protects the heart. And for a believer, the breastplate of righteousness is faithfully living out the truth in our lives, right? Our righteousness comes from Jesus, right? Our main source of armor is our relationship to Jesus and this righteousness that we hold because we're in relationship with him. Because how does the enemy attack your righteousness in your life? He comes at you with what? Unrighteousness, right? 
The enemy tries to control you and lead you and kind of plant you into this place of living in sin. He wants you to lead an unrighteous life, a life that is unfaithful to what you all know and believe. Right, the sin that is evident in your life is often a good sign of knowing that you're being attacked. Because uh, sometimes we're so caught up in it. Sometimes we're so caught up in the sin, we don't even notice it anymore. Right? We struggle with things. There's addiction, right? Sometimes there's an unforgiveness, and we think it's a righteous unforgiveness, and we think we're okay with it. Sometimes we, there's situations where we just live as if God doesn't exist or matter in that specific place or time. It's not something that you do all the time, but maybe your life is so compartmentalized that in certain situations, you don't realize, right, that you're sinning or that what you're doing is not what you should be doing. Maybe this comes out, right, where you justify it so much. Maybe you're in a relationship. You have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and you think crossing the line is okay because you deeply love each other, and one day you are going to get married. Let me tell you, crossing those lines, that's sin, right? It says it in the Bible. But there are places that we think we can justify the sin in our lives. And that justification is the enemy, right? Leading you into this place of unrighteous living, unholy living. And I know this is, like, I hope maybe obvious to us and we understand this to be true, but it becomes so difficult at times to really live this out, right? To really guard against sin in our life. Uh, it becomes challenging because sin is so prevalent. We live in a fallen world and there's difficulty and challenges to overcome. But that's why we equip ourselves with the breastplate, or breastplate of righteousness, we live in accordance to what Jesus called us to live. Our living righteously protects our heart and truly allows us to overcome these attacks of the enemy. Continuing on, what do we have next? The gospel of peace at your feet. We see it at the bottom. Like shoes don't pop out at you as something that is a piece of armor right away, right? Shoes are something that you just wear uh, but at first glance, you're thinking, ah, that's not really a piece of armor. But let me tell you, shoes are probably the most important thing that you're going to wear, right? Because if you don't have shoes, how far do you really get? Have you ever walked any amount of distance without wearing shoes? Sometimes you're at the beach walking across the sand. You don't have sandals on. Sand gets hot, right? It's not so easy to get around. I watched this show uh, on Discovery. It, the title is a little bit weird, but it's actually an interesting show. It's called Naked and Afraid. Right? They place these people out in the middle of nowhere. They're naked. They have nothing but whatever. They bring a knife, and sometimes they bring a match to, to light. They have nothing else. And one of the biggest challenges these people have is that they don't have shoes. They don't care that they're not wearing clothes. Right? They don't care that they're not wearing clothes. It's their, their feet. They're walking across the hot, the hot dirt and the hot gravel. They're stepping over thorns. They have no protection on their feet. Right? So the first thing they try to do is figure out a way to manufacture some kind of shoes for them to protect themselves. You know, for Roman soldiers, they wore these thick leather sandals, right? Thick leather sandals that strapped to their feet, and they were able to march and march and march because their feet were protected. Shoes are an important piece of armor uh, for you, right? The believer as well. Our shoes are called the gospel of peace. This is important because this implies that because of our belief in the gospel, right, is this the gospel that gives us peace. It is the gospel that gives us purpose. It is the gospel that gives us hope. And because of the gospel, we have to be able to be, able to be ready to share it with those people in and around us. And it's also the blueprint of how we live out our lives, right? Because we live as believers in the light, not in the darkness. And as a result, our relationship and the way we live out our life has to be reflected of that gospel truth. You know, the enemy will try to attack your peace 
in your life with what? With anxiousness, with fear, with doubt, with uncertainty, and anything else that shakes this peace in your life. This is what he does, right? This is what the enemy does. He tries to disrupt your life of peace when you have those anxious feelings, right? When there's an unrelenting fear, it's the enemy poking you, it's jabbing you. But knowing the gospel and living it out is how you truly surrender and know that you have the peace of God that protects us against the enemy's attacks of these things. Kind of going along with that, we also have the shield of faith, right? The Roman soldier was his primary defensive weapon, right? It was this long shield, this broad shield that almost covered his entire body. And it not only just covered his body, but almost covered the person next to him uh, as well. Uh, and it, it protected them as a unit, right? Together, they can stand with these shields uh, and be protected. What is the shield for all of us? Our shield is our faith, right? Paul calls it the shield of faith. Our faith is the shield that protects us from the fiery arrows that the enemy shoots at us. And believe me when I say it, the enemy attacks us from far and from wide, from every angle. And how does the enemy attack your faith? He leads you to unfaithfulness, right? To a life of unfaithfulness. He wants you to lose your faith. He wants you to lose your ground in your relationship with Jesus. Faith is a powerful tool that the enemy has. Because when we don't have faith, what do we have? Right? You lose hope. You lose your relationship. You lose what you are holding on to Jesus with. The element of faith is this powerful piece of the relationship with Jesus, right? Pastor Richard just preached about this. Preached about faith, right? Pastor he said that there's, faith has the power to save and also has the power to produce fruit. And our enemy doesn't want you to have salvation. He doesn't want you to produce fruit. He doesn't want you to produce good fruit in your life. So he leads you to this life of unfaithfulness. Because without faith, you can't do much, right? Like I said, there is no hope. There's this loss. There's confusion. There's vulnerability. We almost lose our bearing because we don't have faith. Ultimately, that's why your faith has to be solid and it has to be strong and it has to be tested. It has to be stretched and you live out your faith. And the more you have a faith history with God, the easier it is to lean on your shield of faith, right? Because if you, it's one thing to know that God will provide for you. It's one thing to believe that and to hold that in your heart. And I, I, I truly hope that we all do in this room, that we know, at least in our minds, that God is a faithful provider in every given circumstance. But when you experience it, when you've actually lived that out and you've seen it happen with your own eyes in your own life, that God is faithful in this way and he provides, and you see it happen over and over, over again, and you experience these things in your life, it becomes so much stronger of a weapon, right? Or so much stronger of a shield for you because you experience this and you live it out. And it's easier for you to lean in on your faith and in the most dire of circumstances. And faith in God is the shield that covers us against all the enemy's attacks. The next one is the helmet of salvation, right? And the helmet is this vital piece, right? Why? Because it protects your head. It protects your head. It protects your brain, right? Fighting without a helmet can be a dangerous proposition, right? You can receive a deadly blow because you don't have protection. That's why the Roman, Roman soldiers always wore, right, these metal helmets that protected their heads from these, these deadly blows that would hit them. For the believer, the, the helmet of salvation is also one of the most important pieces of armor, right? Salvation 
or better yet, knowing, truly knowing that Jesus is your Lord and Savior is what allows you to engage in the fight and have this protection, right? It is actually why you are being attacked is because of your salvation. Because if you think about it, right, think about why would the enemy attack you if you were not a believer? Because if you are not a believer in Jesus, you're basically on the same side as the enemy, right? And you don't attack your own. So you have to almost question. Question it. If you are not under attack or you have not experienced any spiritual attacks in your life, you have to ask yourself why. Right? Why is that the case? Because what does that say about your salvation? What does that say about your relationship with Jesus? Because right? the enemy is going to attack you by having you question your salvation. Or better yet, he may even give you a false sense of security about your salvation, right? Because there are some. There are some that truly believe that they have a relationship with Jesus and that they're saved. And the enemy wants you to have that place. But in reality, their lives don't reflect it. Their actions don't reflect a life of salvation or a relationship with Jesus. And that's a sad place to be, right? That's a difficult place to be because you walk around with this false sense of security thinking, hey, yeah, I'm saved. But in reality, that isn't the case. And the enemy loves that place for you because you are sitting duck because you have no idea what is happening around you. Right, to have a true belief that Jesus died on the cross gives us so much security, so much power, right? Why? Because death was defeated on the cross. And no matter what happens here, no matter what happens in this life, right, our eternal life will be in heaven. And the enemy can never take that away from us. Right? The firm foundation in that belief will get you through the most difficult of situations, the most difficult of times. And the enemy can attack that all he wants. But once you have that assurance of salvation, that is a victory over the enemy. And this is why true salvation is a complete protection over the enemy. You know, so far we've talked about this armor kind of as defensive postures and defensive things uh, that we, we wear and we put on. Um, but all the armor isn't defensive, right? There's a couple of pieces that we also have that are offensive weapons for us. You have to ask yourself, though, you have to ask yourself, do you actually use the offensive weapons that God has given us offensively? As an army, you can't just stay in a defensive position, right? You can't just sit back and think you're going to protect yourself and you never take shots and you never take forwards. If you always just waited for the attack, you'd never win, right? You'd never win and you'd just be vulnerable. You'd be this sitting duck. This is why we move forward and this is why God gave us offensive weapons. It's the sword, right? The sword of the spirit, and it's also prayer. It says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the sword of the spirit is the word of God, and the sword is a powerful weapon that the soldier happen, or that, ha that has, right? It allows them to attack and to move forward. For the military, it was this, this weapon, right, that, that kind of s sliced and diced and moved forward and allowed them uh, to defeat their enemies. But what is the sword for the believer? Right? What is the sword for us? It is the word of God. Right? The sword is the word of God. And that's why spending time in the word becomes so important. Right? It allows us to wield this mighty weapon against our enemy. And we see this in action. Right? When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert, every time he tempted him, what did Jesus do? Jesus came back with him. Right? With scripture. He kept coming back with him, right? With the word of God. Every turn, every time, Satan would tempt him and he'd come back. With scripture, he would go back and attack. 
And we're all called to do the same thing, right? Because the deeper our knowledge, our understanding gives us a better skill with this weapon. And I think a lot of us don't have that skill because we don't have the knowledge in the word of God. There's a great opportunity for you guys coming up, actually starting this week, where we have our summer Bible study series. This is a great time for a plug for the Bible study series. It's happening on Wednesday and Thursday uh, for the next month. And also, if you guys aren't doing anything, or even if you are, set aside time. Come to one of the Bible studies. You don't have to go to both of them, but there's one on Wednesday and there's one on Thursday. Spend some time learning about the Word of God. This is your training with your sword. This is your training in your ability to wield the sword against the enemy. Using the word of God against the enemy is to speak against the enemy, and it's how we attack and how we move forward, right? Because the word of God allows us to minister to people. It allows us to evangelize, and it allows us to do missions work. It allows us to go beyond what we just know and see here. It's how we advance the kingdom. And it's how we take back ground. You know, I, I once asked, like, one of the very first times, a very long time ago when we went out evangelizing, they kept giving us different Bible verses to use when we were evangelizing to people. And I was like, well, this is interesting to me because logically I was like, I'm going to use the word of God. I'm going to share scripture with somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus and he doesn't believe in the word of God. So what effect does that really have on him, right? But really the, the response from the pastor that was teaching us. It's like, there is power, right? There is power in the word of God. And that the Holy Scripture, when shared with people, and when you speak the word of God to people, there is power there, and it has the power to effectively change and transform, heal and restore. And it has the power to attack the enemy and defeat the enemy. Right? Along with that, prayer is another offensive weapon, right? In verse 18, it says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Right? Prayer is the best way to stay on the offensive as well, right? Because this is a direct communication, right? You can think of it as your CV radio or your phone or whatever you need to, 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 to connect with your source of power. And who is our source of power? It's God, right? And through prayer. Spending time in prayer allows us, allows us, Yeah, so spending time in prayer allows us to stay in communication, to stay engaged with God. Like, how do you ultimately use these offensive weapons that God has given us, right? We use the word of God and we use prayer, not just for ourselves, right? Not just for our own edification, which is good. We should, right? We should spend in time just learning and growing, and that helps us wield our weapon. But you have to spend time in prayer also for others, right? Because if you're constantly engaged in prayer and you're asking God, well, God, protect me in this. God, cover me in this. Right? Save me from this situation. Those are good prayers, right? That's great because you're asking for God's covering. But that is strictly defensive, right? We are not reaching out and pushing beyond You have to pray for opportunities to share the gospel. You have to pray for God to put you in places so you can be a blessing to other people, right? We pray for opportunities. We pray for the conviction to go out on missions. We pray for the conviction to evangelize in our own backyards, in our own workplace, in our schools, wherever we may be, in our spheres of influence, right? We ask God for the boldness to be able to do that. Not just to equip yourself, but to actually be bold and to actually take action. That's how 
you use prayer and the word of God as an offensive weapon. You know, this yesterday, um, we went to Pastor Kwang Shin Kim, uh, who's Dr. Wan, Pastor Wan's father's uh, funeral. And if you don't know who this man is, um, he is the former founding and senior pastor uh, of Grace Church, Grace Korean Church. Uh, and this man actually is also one of Pastor Keith's uh, mentors in his life. If you ever hear Pastor Keith talking about his mentor, he's actually talking about Pastor Kim. Uh, and you know, as I was at his funeral and I'm listening to um, the eulogies and I, as I was talking to Pastor Juan about his father and I was talking to Pastor Keith uh, about him, you really understand what this man did, right? He lived a life with full armor on, but he was always on the offensive, right? He was a man of prayer, not just for himself, he was a man of prayer for others to find that conviction to go out on missions. You may not believe this, but this man in this church and the people that he's called alongside to work with him, they planted thousands of churches right across Russia and Asia and South America because he was willing to pray and ask God to open up opportunities to have him meet people, right? To be offensive in what he was doing because he understood and understood or understands that we had to take ground back from the enemy. There are so many people that have not had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Well, there's so many people, right, that don't have a faith. And as believers, we're called, right, to be a blessing and to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that doesn't always mean that you have to go to the remotest part of Africa or you have to go to deep China. It means you can share the gospel with whomever you meet, wherever you meet, in your sphere of influence. Ask God for those opportunities when you spend time in prayer. Right, the way to overcome the enemy is with a deeply devoted prayer life. And I know that this is to be a challenge, right? It's a challenge, it's a difficulty to have a consistent prayer life. But as a minimum threshold, as a believer, right, we have to spend time in the word and in prayer. Because if we don't, the enemy keeps taking ground, taking ground against us. And at the end of the day, it comes down to this, right? It's about putting on the full armor of God. That's what Paul to put on the full armor of God. And I believe that many of us in this room, we have armor on, right? Like there, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind, everyone in this room has some of the armor on. I don't know if all of us have all the armor of God on, the full armor of God. I'm sure there's many of you, helmet of salvation, not a problem, right? You truly understand with God. That's not a problem. Or maybe you have the belt of truth on. And that's something you truly hold and you, you hold dearly and you know. But Paul is saying, we need the full armor of God. That's each and every one of these pieces. And that's how we stand against the enemy. That's how we stand against the attacks of the enemy. We need it all, right? We need all of it, not just some of it. We need all of it. And the full armor of God gives us the protection we need to stand against the enemy. And that's why I want to encourage you. I truly encourage you. Take stock of where you are. Ask God the places that you need to tighten up. Right? The places that you need to really re-gear up and put on and see. You have to resolve this with God. Because if you don't, we leave ourselves vulnerable. We leave ourselves vulnerable a mile away from us. And trust me, the enemy will figure out any which way to attack and try to separate you from your relationship with God. So put it on. 
Put on each one of these pieces. Go through it. See where you are and allow God to help you because God wants nothing more than for each and every one of us, each and every one of you, to be fully outfitted and fully ready and fully engaged in this battle, in the spiritual warfare that is happening. Because the enemy is going to attack you, right? It's going to attack you with the lies, the unrighteousness, the fear, the anxiousness, the pride, the anger. He's going to try to make you lose your faith along the way. He's going to make you question your salvation. He's going to do whatever he can. Do whatever he can to derail your relationship with our Lord and Savior. And if we're not watching, and if we're not ready, it could happen, right? It can happen. You know, as we call up the worship team, and we prepare our hearts for communion, I want us to take a few moments, right? Take a few moments now and really ask God, like, where am I in this battle? Have I been on the losing end of it each and every day? Or am I equipped? Am I ready? Am I able to stand my ground? Am I able to advance and be offensive in what I'm doing? Let God really speak into your hearts. And I encourage you, as God reveals this to you, don't just take it and have it as something that you, you now know in your mind. But do something about it, right? Do something about it. If you need to sharpen your sword, spend more time in the Word. Come to one of the Bible studies. Meet with any one of the pastors when you have questions. Right? If you feel the enemy attacking you, you have to do what you can to stand against it. And as Paul just taught us in this passage, we put on the full armor of God and allow us to step into the battle fully engaged and fully ready. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, so much for loving us in the ways that you do. And Lord, as we have stepped out into the battleground, we know that you just didn't put us out there without protection, without cover. Lord, we have this full suit of armor at our disposal. And I pray that each and every one of us would know and understand what it is to be fully suited, fully ready, and fully ready to engage the enemy. Lord, speak to my brothers and sisters even now in places that they need help, or they need to tighten up, or they need to strengthen. Allow us, Lord God, to really be ready to engage and to protect ourselves from the attacks of the enemy. Holy Spirit, come, fill this place Fill our hearts and let us hear your voice. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.